So your name is Elliot Odd Edges. Uh, yeah. My name is my name is Elliot Andrew Edge. Um, Odd Edges is a handle, uh, an internet handle that I picked up around 2006 when my brother and I started uploading uh, videos to YouTube together, and um, it just felt appropriate for us. We've always been making you know avant-garde films and comedies and sort of strange, unusual things. So Odd Edges ended up really kind of taking on a life of its own and um, became a little bit of a mask where I was playing with, you know, remix videos. And, you know, remix videos, of course, uh, flirt with copyright infringement. And, um, you know, they do that purposefully because the whole idea is to take something that exists and then to manipulate it in certain ways and then to represent it as the artist. So it has that kind of... Um, Hip hop element to it, graffiti culture element to it, of taking on, uh, as well as internet culture is of course famous for taking on pseudonyms, and then the pseudonyms, uh, you know, if you indulge them long enough, will take on a life of their own. So, Odd Edges almost feels now, almost kind of like a brand. Um, uh, I, like for example, I don't consider my Facebook page to really be about me. <laughs> but, you know, of course, everyone's going to argue against that. But, you know, it's Odd Edge's Facebook page. You know, um, I like to... It was sort of a way of compartmentalizing my consciousness because, you know, there were so many years where I was trying desperately to be a straight, normal person. And, yeah, as I see today, that's failed miserably. Yeah. All right, so... Uh so tell me about the theory behind the idea that life is a video game. Start from the beginning and uh, try your best to describe it in, in basic detail for the kids. Certainly. Let's begin with, um, you know, you could you could consider immediately social norms when someone says life is a video game. You can think of personal realities, political realities, religious realities. And um, if you want to look at them metaphorically and, or on a just a higher plane of consideration, you can aptly apply a metaphor of life as a video game and each one of these little things are you know, reality tunnels, as Robert Anton Wilson always said. Um, so that's one way of considering uh, video games that our lives are little video games and we're little characters in them, but what's far more fascinating is uh, the science behind the suggestion of life being a video game. Now that science um, showed up really in a big way in the 90s with a guy named Edward Fredkin. And Fredkin uh, has a website now called Digital Philosophy. And his whole thing was founding this idea that reality is mostly information. He was really the big guy. One of the earlier pioneers was, I think, uh, Wheeler, who wrote an essay called It From Bit, and that's written about a lot in Seth Lloyd's book, Programming the Universe, and he's an MIT um, quantum computer physicist, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, it's the same notion that reality is essentially information. And the big feud going on with them right now is, is information physical or is information essentially non-physical? That's where the argument is today in this <coughs> domain. But the idea actually goes back really, really far if you want to think about uh, Maya in Hindu and Buddhist scripture, the idea of the world being an illusion. And, um, you know, that's actualized by an observer. It's the same sort of notion right there, too. Particularly the science is what has caught my attention about this entire thing because when you consider our own lives, our personas, um, our belief systems, our religions, our psychologies, um, our even, even our own process of thinking, um, it becomes recontextualized when you start considering the implication of being in a computer-simulated reality. That's what this is all about, is the idea that reality is virtual, um, essentially probabilistic in that, um, you know, a particle is not actualized until it's observed. A phenomena isn't actualized until it's observed. And until that happens, it's all unrendered, just like in a video game where the map, player in the map, 
Uh, the, the level doesn't show up until the player gets there. It's sitting there waiting for the player, but it doesn't really show up until the player is present. So those are some kind of broad stroke ideas about it. Tom Campbell is the one who really got me um, interested in this topic, and he's who the film is primarily about. Right. What's, um, what are the implications of this uh, for a spiritually-minded person, say, just your average, everyday person who, uh, who knows, maybe goes to yoga or something, but that's the extent of anything that they do. I mean, what implications does this have for people of all religions, people who believe in Allah, people who believe in Jesus? Uh, what, what do you think that this entails, or how can how can this be related to them? Well, to tell you the truth, I think this is all of what these spiritualities are talking about, whether it's a religion or a mystical school or even a philosophical school. Um, a lot of them, I think, are talking about an underlying or an overlying Rea- or overlaying reality of some kind, that there's an invisible world an invisible wor- and a visible world, and that somehow how we, per- not, not only just the interface between consciousness and reality, but somehow that there's a, there's a morality to it. In other words, there's, there's some kind of a point system, some kind of experience point system, where if you do good, you get, you know, karmic points in one direction that encourages, you know, your spiritual evolutionary growth. And on the other hand, you have stuff which uh, impedes it. Um, that's really the immediate way to think about this. Uh, this is, I think, life as a video game is a metaphor for the spiritually minded person, though not exclusively. Uh, this is most appropriate. I mean, it's really what they're talking about. Every religion and spirituality is sort of selling a user manual, a walkthrough guide, a strategy guide, because we've all sort of emerged um, out of nowhere, you know, if you go by the materialist sort of view, for no reason, from nothing, all right? We've shown up, and we don't know what to do. We have no idea what we're doing here, and there's all these local religions and mystical schools and stuff, and each one of them sort of peddle the same sort of concept, which is if you do these practices, these techniques, you know, if you learn these, these abilities, then um, this will enhance your spiritual development, your personal development, and so on and so forth. Um, considering that right there, um, take a look at like the very first video games uh, uh, of the Zelda series. Zelda has a really great beginning in that um, Link, your main character, shows up in the middle of a field, out of nowhere. Just He just shows up. This is a revolutionary thing for video games. Um, it was so revolutionary, in fact, that I think that the guys at Nintendo didn't know if people would be able to handle it, like they wouldn't know what to do, because you could walk in four different directions. There was uh, three different places you could go, and uh, also a small cave that you could walk into, and of course, when you walk into the cave, you get, I think, the sword or the shield, and there's a famous line that says, um, it's dangerous to go alone, take, uh, it's dangerous to go alone, take this, it's sort of a classic moment in video games. And then Link has to, you know, explore and get help and learn lessons and find instructions. So I think all these spiritual schools and religious schools are really selling us instruction manuals and strategy guides. Some of them more effective than others. Some of them have a lot of fat. Uh, some of them have a lot of cultural clothing, historic clothing, traditional clothing um, that they've hold, held on to for, you know, many centuries and many millennia. But essentially, I think they're basically talking about what a video game is all about. You have free will, you have choice, you have consequences. What do you do? Uh, how do you play? Most of us want to know how to play. We don't, we're terrified <laughs> of being here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very confusing. So where do we go? What do we do? A lot of these religions give you a path. You know, and I think essentially this is that, that that's what they're talking about is getting some kind of path, getting some kind of tradition, getting some kind of structure. You know, and as long as that path or structure doesn't um, keep you in fixed uh, traps, and unfortunately a lot of them do, a lot of them are completely loaded with traps, and the traps sound like anything from there's no God to I'm God to there's many gods to, I mean, Take your pick. So each one of them has their own bents and things like that. 
uh, this is kind of a stripping away of those things. It's not an outright denial. It's not saying that these things don't exist. But it's really more like if you want to get to the bare bones, let's talk about the metaphor. Let's talk about the meta reality to all these things. That's that's really where our conversation has been taking us anyway, especially since postmodernism and now digimodernism with the internet. We're really talking about, you know, an overview of all these systems. And this is definitely in line with that tradition. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so here lies the, the chicken or the egg question. So if life is a video game, who programs the video game, and are they living in uh, a video game in an eternal feedback loop of of causality? Yeah, this is really interesting. This this is a this is a question that's really uh, difficult to answer, and um, uh, almost unknowable. Uh, at least on my end, the uh, the guy I'm making a film about is a guy named Tom Campbell, and Tom is a, a really hardcore um, out-of-body experiencer, you could say, or astral projector, or some such thing like that. In other words, he, it's very easy for him to parallel process other realities, and he got really into exploring other physical realities, other non-physical realities. Um, after he learned how to quiet his mind with meditation and learned how to do out-of-body experience with Robert Monroe and the Monroe Institute, which he helped develop some serious technology for, he got into this himself and said, you kind of bump up into a wall. Like, the metaphor he uses is a bacteria in someone's gut. You know, um, that bacteria could have, you know, a 5 million point IQ, but it's not going to know anything about what's going on outside of the body because as far as it knows, food just comes in and that's that. So it's not going to have any comments on Shakespeare or meteorology or, you know, basketball or anything like that. This is, this might not be, this information might not be available to us. However, what he implies is that if it's conscious, if it's a conscious system, if it exists outside of consciousness, then it's not, it might not be legitimate, it might not exist. His whole thing is that reality is consciousness, consciousness is information. And that's the thing that's gotten me into this. Going back to your question, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, continue. All right, going back to your question here, um, who programmed the programmer? Um, were they programmed? How did it begin? I mean, it looks like it began with a simple rule set. If you look at John Conway's Game of Life, you can just uh, you know, YouTube that, John Conway's Game of Life. He proved in the 70s that if you come up with a really simple, I mean simple rule set, like three or four rules, and then you push go and put some energy into it, then you get incredibly complex structures that show up. Now, that's called emergence and computation. It's also emergence in nature. You get a seed, the seed becomes a tree, that tree evolves over time and becomes a different kind of tree. So you have simplicity becoming incredibly complex over time. So that's the degree to which it'd be programmed because this is really an evolutionary type thing. We're seeing um, a simple universe evolve into a very complex one. In fact, um, uh, I forgot. I forgot the name of the. Uh, it was three something with the acronym, but it was some kind of satellite or telescope that they shot out, and they found these baby galaxies. And these baby galaxies were incredible because they were so structured, and there were so many of them, and they were completely unanticipated by cosmology. But what it showed was that even galaxies tend to grow in the same way that biology grows. In fact, I remember one interesting kind of fact that a younger galaxy will produce more stars than an older one. And it couldn't help me think of, you know, animal pubescence, how generally a younger creature tends to have a stronger libido than an older one and will just pump out all the time. <laughs> I'm kind of giving that sort of vision, of course. I'm 26, so you can imagine why, right? <laughs> um, but as for who programmed them, um, I don't know. I do not know. That is something. This this is something that makes me really interested. Is that there there must have been some kind of catalyst for a catalyst for a catalyst for a catalyst. But it's very it's very difficult to talk about ultimate origin, ultimate alpha. I think we bump into our own naivete when we address this issue. But 
I certainly think it's uh, worth our attention and worth our time. I certainly don't subscribe to that the universe came from nothing. You know, this uh, Lawrence Krauss is very big on pushing this idea that the universe came from nothing, but even if you take a look at his description of nothing, there is an element of the physical in it. There are the laws of physics at work in his thing, so it's not ultimate nothing. There's still law of physics. That means yeah, there's still laws. a rule. Yeah, laws so it's don't... not ultimate nothing. Laws don't hmm? come from, from thin air, I 